Welcome, Minister. It's very nice having you. So cooperative security, as we have envisioned it 30 years ago with the Paris Carter, seems to be under threat. We have conflicts in Europe, not only in the Western Balkans, that has calmed down, but Ukraine is still there. Europe, the EU, seems to be in between China and the US. The US is, of course, still a partner, but a challenging one, let's put it that way. So cooperative, working together, is for the EU, but also for countries which want to join the EU, extremely important. How does that look for North Macedonia from a point of view of a minister of defense if cooperative security is so much under threat? Is that worrying you? As, as uh, a Minister of Defense of North Macedonia, I, I have to say that we have tried to uh, walk the walk and not talk the talk. And we have uh, uh, really invested uh, in collective security, not in terms of statements and in terms of formal positions, but in terms of how we devised our policies and how we practically approached our neighbors. And we do believe that especially for countries in Europe and for a relatively uh, small countries, this is the investment that we can make in collective security. Having two agreements uh, that have closed two very difficult and long-standing issues with Greece and Bulgaria was an investment in collective security. And I, I do believe that we are seeing dividends from that investment. We have been stuck in a very unproductive dispute with both Greece and Bulgaria. And we have shown that with bold leadership and with a policy that avoids the typical populistic positions, you can solve the problems. It's not that they were easy. It's not that they were in terms of political price cheap, but it was very clear that if there is a will, there is a way. And of course, the problem with bilateral disputes is that you have to have the will on both sides. It cannot be asymmetrical, and it cannot arise from one of the capitals. The OSCE now is in trouble, not only from content-wise, but they also have a leadership problem. For North Macedonia, is a platform like the OSCE, which has cooperation in its name, still an important um, organization for security? Well, we have regretted also the developments in OSCE and the fact that uh, there was no decision made by member states. The, this is always the difficulty of, of big organizations. It is difficult to act uh, on, on a consensus base. But uh, as a platform for discussion, it is equally, if not even more important. But it has to go beyond the discussion. Uh, we have all learned the game of having the right statements and the right formal positions. But then we have learned the game also of breaching those words and those commitments. And I think that OSC commitments uh, are equally valid when it comes to rule of law, when it comes to democracy, and when it comes to the goal of security through democratic values. And uh, we have seen that many people, even, even certain uh, countries, believe that you know, the charters are a certain kind of menu. It's a la carte. You can pick and choose and you can combine them. But this creates only an impression of security. In the long run, it undermines security even more than the open, let's say, uh, vocal conflict. We, as a country who has gone through hell, uh, both uh, in the 90s during the former Yugoslavia war and also through our own, uh, difficulties. I think uh, I'm allowed to say that political solutions based on some core values are a guarantee for long-term stability. We have seen positive, we have seen some negative consequences, positive consequences of applying these rules and negative consequences of breaching them. What we have seen, for example, in the previous 10 years uh, of a very autocratic government was that breaching the rules of the game and breaching the core democratic values gives you only the sense of security, the image of security. But it's really a Potemkin's village. It's just the makeup that stands for a certain period of time and then the whole construction collapses. 
So in order to build a more resilient society, in order to build a more secure region, we have seen that we need to invest in solving and not in freezing the conflicts or the problems. You think that the structures of security in Europe is still good enough? What one has to do, fill it with political engagement and political will. Is, am, I, am I understanding you correctly? This is also part of my general philosophy. I don't, I have very often seen that once we encounter a problem, we say, okay, let's come up with a new architecture and, you know, uh, the problem will disappear. And of course, you spend five to 10 years developing this architecture and then you end up having to deal with the same problem because uh, actually it was not tackled. Yes, sometimes you need to, how can I say, rearrange the cards on the table. It is useful, especially in negotiations. Whenever we approach a serious political problem, we have to have a valid assessment on what are the real interests of the parties involved. And if these real interests involve safety and security in real terms, then I think sitting by the table with the available architecture is an option. If the interests are diverging, then it's an issue that the old and probably even the new architecture will not solve. Do you see for the next couple of years, five, ten, and I understand you don't have a crystal ball and as a minister, of course, you don't want to <laughs> look in this crystal ball, but you have a lot of experience. But do you see that in Europe one could come back to cooperative security Or do you feel this is not the time and somehow we have to manage the status quo and this is the maximum we can do? I'm an optimist by nature, uh, uh, but I'm a realist by profession. And I have to say that I don't expect any big change of hearts very soon in the future. I think that the status quo has... Uh, become convenient for too many. Uh, on the other side, I mean, we also have to take into account the cer that certain agreements that were seen as really historic in the past, like the nuclear treaty, have not been outdated. They have been breached by someone. And this, I think, generally undermines the interest and the political will to talk about future agreements. I remember participating in many negotiations, conflict and post-conflict in my country, 2001 and post-2001. The key condition for making more difficult agreements come true is respecting the easier ones. Without that hope and aspiration to respect the world, to respect the signed agreement, to respect even the spirit of the cooperation, I think it's very difficult to expect that someone will be not optimistic, but to a certain extent naive to go further. And you know that, for example, in uh, the North Atlantic Alliance, there are very often strong voices for investing in renewed dialogue. And they are very visible, they are influential, But even these countries and these politicians could not come around a very clear signals that what was agreed no longer applies. The optimist in me reminds me that in the long run, the interests should be the same. If we talk about interests of countries and the people. Whenever we discuss the interests of countries and players, we also have to take into account the interests of their leaders. And in a perfect world, they would coincide fully. In our realistic world, sometimes they're antagonizing. And when you draw this complicated map of various interests, uh, I think the time has not come for all the different players to reconsider their long-term needs. And I think that very openly, quite a number of them have entered the race of power. 
I don't underestimate the importance of power. And this is why deterrence makes sense. Even when we were talking about negotiations in small North Macedonia, we also had to, to calculate the element of power. It was uh, uh, either our own domestic power or the NATO troops who were there or the EU monitors who were supportive. Without this element, the political dialogue would not have worked. So uh, I, I do believe that the right uh, measure of deterrence and dialogue is a good recipe for NATO. The modus vivendi to find something that we keep peace in Europe is important, but we are not looking at the moment for a big breakthrough because it's not the time for that. Is that, that do I understand you correctly? Uh, it's easy to say it's not the right time. We are creating our own time and we are contributing to, uh, to, to our future and we are shaping our, uh, our period. Uh, but I have to say that uh, no one should be naive uh, and uh, miss the discrepancy between the statements for peace and the acts of conflict. In your countries, one could see the consequences of war and the missing of peace, but in other parts of Europe, peace is the normal. Would you support the idea that a narrative for a peaceful cooperation would be good to have? Or do you think it's just good enough what we have at the moment? I, I take your point and I fully agree with you that peace is uh, taken for granted in Europe. Uh, having in mind the history of our continent and, ha and having in mind the history of our planet, peace should never be taken for granted. I do believe that uh, the discussions about how peace has supported uh, the European Union's progress in the last 60, 50, 70 years uh, is very important to remind, especially the young ones, that this was not the norm. My generation uh, was born in peace and raised in peace. And then we were shocked when war first moved closer and then in our countries and in our lives. And this is why uh, even, even today, we tend to make reference. This should not be taken for granted. And I think in Europe, this is even, even more important. But as I say, talking about peace is important. Working on peace is more difficult. And uh, sometimes allowing words to dominate makes us detached from reality. But, uh, if the Balkan countries found a way to reconcile their differences, if we could, in practically a period of three years, open and solve really difficult issues at a big political price, and then if we were able to convince our voters that this is the path to choose and still win, after very difficult compromises, win elections just, just a few weeks ago, then it's, uh, I think it's a message of hope. And I think that people appreciate our bold moves. If we are determined to stand by them and to explain them and to say that this was good for everyone. So uh, I think that uh, regardless of the situation in the world, leadership is essential. Uh, leadership that does not undermine the problem that does not uh, minimize the problems, that doesn't shy away from uh, open issues, uh, but leadership that is willing to invest in something better.